Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Kerry Timchuk, Executive Director of the Oregon Historical Society, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to a special Tuesday night program uh, entitled Imminent Oregonians, a uh, new book that just came out and is for sale at the, uh, our, of course, our wonderful gift shop at the uh, Oregon Historical Society. So if you're inclined to uh, purchase, it, purchase it after hearing the, tonight's program, yeah, please, please do so, and, and there's the book. Uh, with, with instructions uh, on how to how to get it. Uh, we have, the, as I said, the book is titled Eminent Oregonians, and we have three eminent Oregonians with us this evening, great authors and journalists, and we'll get to them in a minute. And we always we, we begin, with, of course, with the land acknowledgement. Uh, wherever you are uh, tonight, you are located on the lands, of course, of indigenous land. Here in Portland and uh, the area, we are located on the lands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, what Lala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other ind indigenous nations of the Columbia River. So tonight we have with us three very distinguished, as I said, eminent Oregonians, uh, Jane Kirkpatrick, Greg Noakes, and Steve Forrester, each of them uh, very talented and very accomplished. And I'm gonna turn the program over to them and we'll, we're gonna hear about the three subjects of their book, Eminent Oregonians, Three Who Matter. And Steve, uh, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, this book had a certain amount of its birth at the Oregon Historical Society. Um, 30 years ago, when I came up with this concept, Chet Orloff, who was one of Kerry's predecessors, encouraged me. Uh, it went nowhere because I spent those 30 years in daily journalism. But once I retired some three years ago, I revisited it with Chet. And uh, I subsequently uh, recruited uh, Greg Noakes, who was keen to write about Jesse Applegate. And then through Greg, I was able to find Jane Kirkpatrick. I wanted to, I wanted a chapter on Kirkpatrick, on sorry, on uh, Abigail Scott Dunaway. And Jane was willing to do that. So our format will be that uh, we'll each speak for 10 minutes about our subjects, our chapters, and then we'll take questions. So we'll lead off with Jane, um, who is a, uh, I refer to as a, re a renowned novelist, uh, best-selling novelist, and uh, who lives in Bend. So uh, Ben, uh, so uh, Jane, please start off about Abigail. I will, thank you very much, Steve, and Carrie as well. Um, it's really a delight to be here and, and talking about Abigail Scott Dunaway. I wanna just begin with how I began the chapter, which is actually a poem uh, not written by Abigail, although she did write poems, um, but this is a poem by uh, William Stafford, one of our um, also eminent Oregonians who was an, um, one of the first poet laureates. And, this, and the poem, I, I included it in Abigail's work because I think it exemplifies the capacity she had to stay focused for more than 40 years, trying to get women the vote and for working on behalf of women and reducing women's vulnerability, both to education on medical and socially and economically. And the poem is called The Way It Is. <clears throat> it said, there's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can never get lost. Tragedies happen, people get sick and die. You suffer and grow old. You never let go of the thread. Abigail Scott Dunaway hung on to a thread that she um, never let go of. And it must have been confusing sometimes for her husband of many years, for her six children, for her many sisters, for her brother who was, um, the editor of the Oregonian for some time and who opposed women's suffrage. <clears throat> it must have been difficult for them to see what it was that sustained her, what kept her going. So I wanted to explore that. I, um, this was quite a challenge for me in part because I had not ever written anything like a biography and it was intimidating <laughs> because there were wonderful biographies already written by people um, like Jean Ward and um, first name can't remember, but Moynihan, who did these wonderful works on Abigail. 
And what I wanted to do was to look at her through a different lens. And so I chose four different um, lens to look through her life. And the four lens were actually inspired by uh, four women of color who painted their versions of the American West. It was an exhibit that I saw in 2000 in Colorado and it was called Expanded Visions. And certainly I hoped that I could expand the vision of Abigail. And the first lens is landscape. Abigail came West in 1852 and she was the keeper of the family journal and uh, she writes about the landscape and how much it influenced her. And I think throughout, I tried to capture that in my chapter, how much the landscape um, affected her and how much she at times was challenged by it because she rode all over the country and you know, a rattly old stagecoach and had a typewriter with her on her lap. And, um, and she was challenged by the landscape, but it was also, she was also inspired by it. Um, the second um, lens is relationships. And Abigail had her struggle with relationships. She, um, she was of course uh, the older sister of the youngest brother who was Harvey Scott, who was the, became the editor of the Oregonian. And he had been allowed to go to school, but Abigail had no professional, maybe a year of actual schooling. And the rest of her life, she was self-taught. And you have to wonder, and actually Steve mentioned this when we were first talking about her, he said, imagine what she might have done if she had had some professional schooling. Um, because she taught, she ran a business, a very successful millinery, she wrote 20 novels, um, and she ran a newspaper among just a few things that she did. And her relationships to get those things to happen were really intriguing to sort of look at because she could be incredibly charming and delightful and she was smart and witty, but she could also be really um, crusty and uh, searing. She was quite, could be quite sarcastic. So um, she had to you know, balance all of that and at the same time, keep a marriage going with a very affable and very um, well-liked husband from everything I could read. I think he acted as interference for her relationships sometimes. Um, the third lens was work and what work meant to her. And I think the most important work in some ways was her speaking, which really extended far beyond most women of that time period. She was able to get um, Susan B. Anthony, the very famous suffragist to come out. And in 1871, they toured uh, Washington, Idaho and Oregon and Abigail you know, did her introductions and made all the arrangements and, um, and they, you know, they dodged tomatoes and at the Oregon State Fair, they were competing with you know, the, the dancing bears and the jugglers and so on. Um, but she was, that was incredibly important work for her to keep expanding the role of um, women in putting out the importance of the suffrage movement. She spent 40 years and Oregon had six campaigns and no other state had that many campaigns to get before women got the vote. We did get the vote in Oregon in 1912 before the national amendment was passed, but no other state took that long and had that many campaigns. And so one has to go back to looking at those relationships again and wondering just um, how much she might have um, interfered in sometimes with the efforts of the national associations and the Oregon associations. And then the last um, lens I wanted to look at was what I call spirituality. And, um, if, and for me, that's looking at where people drew their strength from. And uh, for Abigail, there were many times when I would say that she was in the, in the cellar, the, um, the cellar of sorrow. Uh, Kim Stafford, who is the son of the poet I quoted, wrote a book a number of years ago and he talked about how all of us at some point end up in the cellar of sorrow and it's a mark of our character, how we climb up the ladder um, towards some sort of light, no matter how dim or strange. And Abigail, I think the rungs of her ladder um, where she drew her strength and 
I'm really apologizing if you can hear that scratching. It's my dog, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, she climbed up that ladder and I think um, her art was important to her. Her speaking was important to her. Um, I think she, her faith was important to her. She struggled, she struggled with um, how she saw the role of God in her life, but she reports in her biography, in her um, autobiography, that she really felt that her work was divinely inspired. So I'm hoping that you will find a very complicated woman, but that you'll also have the advantage of being able to um, look at her through a different lens and maybe just as a, a biography and or just as a novel, but rather as a, an opportunity to see what she did and when she did it, but also how she did it uh, what her motivation might have been and how she felt. I hope you're moved by the chapter. She is a remarkable woman and one of only six of the 158 names that are listed in the Oregon State Capitol as other eminent Oregonians. So thank you. Yeah. And, and I should add, Jane, that many uh, documents and artifacts from Abigail's life are included in the current <laughs> Nevertheless <laughs> exhibit uh, now at OHS, a fantastic yeah, exhibit. Great, yeah, thank you. Yes, I spent a fair amount of time in various places in libraries, including the RHS um, library and uh, photographic library. So that was great. So am I introducing my friend Greg? And uh, if I am, or I are you going to do that? You, to allow okay. me one detail on Abigail. If you go to Riverview Cemetery in Portland, which I highly recommend, it's where the social register of Portland is. It's the, all the street names are up there. And Harvey Scott, Abigail's brother, has an immense monument. The late Kim Bart McCall referred to it as Harvey's pile of granite. Um, and if you go about a hundred yards, hundred feet maybe away from Harvey's, on the ground is a very modest stone which says Abigail Scott Dunaway. So now we'll hear from Greg Noakes about Jesse Applegate. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And Jane, very nice uh, presentation on your chapter. And Carrie, thank you. Um, what, would, should, could you put a slide up, Sarah? Thank you. Yeah. I have a few slides here I'd like to show. This is, this is Jesse Applegate. And uh, this is the only picture uh, we have of Jesse Applegate. And we don't know how accurate it is. Jesse was kind of an odd duck. He was a bit of an iconoclast, a loner, well-educated, smart, um, the leader of his family. Um, he considered himself as not very attractive, and so he didn't allow a photograph of himself to be taken. And this was a sketch done from memory by his nephew. Um, Jesse came out to Oregon. What, slide, please. The next slide will show his two brothers who had no hesitation in being having their photographs taken, Lindsay on the left and Charles on the right. As a family leader, Jesse decided, they lived in Missouri along the Osage River at the time and they all had productive farms, but Jesse was disgusted over the issue of slavery in Missouri. And uh, he had no, no as a farmer, he had no choice but to hire slaves because there weren't white workers, as I understand it, available to work on the farm. And he was disgusted at that. And he had uh, also worked with some fur traders in, in Missouri who told him about opportunities in the West. So even though he was the youngest of four brothers, he convinced his other brothers to all sell their farms as he did. And they headed out for Oregon on the Oregon Trail. And this was in 1843 on the first major wagon train known as the Great Migration. And Jesse was one of the, uh, the captains of that uh, wagon train. Slide. You can see on the red line, the, the uh, Oregon Trail was the main Oregon Trail from Independence, Missouri up into Oregon. But on the, uh, there's a dotted line here at Fort Hall and that became the uh, California Trail where, where, where settlers would break off and go to California. Well, there was quite a, quite a, uh, slide please, I'm sorry, Sarah. 
the, the, the road route down the Columbia River was quite dangerous and Jesse and Lindsay each lost a son who drowned in the river. Neither of their bodies were ever found, but uh, Jesse and his brothers resolved to try and find another route into Oregon. And they developed what became known as the Applegate Trail, which led south from Fort Hall, Idaho on the California Trail, broke off in what is today's Nevada, and then entered Oregon and went up into the Willamette Valley from the south. So this is known as the Applegate Trail. And it's really what about all I knew about uh, Jesse Applegate was his development of the Applegate Trail. And um, I didn't know about his involvement with Oregon slavery, but that's much of the story that I tell in this book. Uh, slide, please. I just wanted to point this out. This is a descendant of, of uh, Charles Applegate, Shannon Applegate, and she is holding a drum that was on one of the rafts in which the two boys drowned in the Columbia River on their journey down the river. And the drum was later found downriver and saved. <clears throat> and it's now in uh, Charles Applegate's old home down in the Oncala area, where eventually the three brothers eventually settled and built large, very fine homes in that area where they lived for a while. Slide, please. This is the Charles Applegate's house. Uh, it's the only one of the three that survived. But as we understand it, Jesse's and Lindsay's were very much the same, kind of modeled the same way. And as you can tell from this home, it was quite elegant. They were among the first settlers in this area of, Yon of Oregon, which is now in Douglas County uh, in the Umpqua Valley, near the Umpqua Valley. And these are quite elegant homes and they furnished them with a lot of imported goods, including in Jesse's case, a small piano and a lot of carpets and things that they had uh, brought from back east. So they started out with money and did quite well. And Charles Applegate's house is on the National Historic Register and, uh, and can be visited and it was built in 1852. So slide please. And there's a, a road sign. We don't quite know exactly where Jesse's house was there in the Oncala Valley, but there is a road sign nearby what was thought to, to be his, uh, near his home. Slide, please. And there's a little history on Jesse, 1843, pioneer from Missouri. One of the captains of the wagon train developed the Applegate Trail. And um, the, what I folk, I'm gonna focus on in the talk here is his role at the Constitutional Convention where he opposed slavery for Oregon. And this is a quote that, uh, that he gave during the opening debate at the Constitutional Convention in Salem. That was in 1857. And I should say that um, at this point in Oregon's history, slavery was like the burning issue in Oregon. Would Oregon be or not be a slave state? And Jesse was a leader of those who were opposing slavery for Oregon. He'd had it with slavery in Missouri. He was bound and determined not to allow it to exist in Oregon. So this is a quote from the debate at the, Const at the Constitutional Convention. The discussion of the subject of slavery by this body is out of place and uncalled for and only calculated to engender bitter feelings among the members of the body, destroy its harmony, retard its business and unnecessarily prolong its session. Unfortunately, it was, it was discussed, but it wasn't approved. But what did come out of that convention was uh, a, a, a exclusion law against allowing black Americans in, into Oregon, which uh, remained in Oregon's constitution, sadly, until 1926. Slide, please. This is what the Oregon, how the Oregon constitution read after the, uh, after the uh, constitution was approved. No free Negro or mulatto not residing in this state at the time of the adoption of this constitution shall come reside or be within this state or hold any real estate or make any contracts or maintain any suit therein. And the legislative assembly shall provide by penal laws for the removal by public officers of all such Negroes and mulattoes and for their effectual exclusion from the state and for the punishment of persons who shall, bring, who shall bring them into the state or employ or harbor them. As I said, it's no longer in the constitution. It was removed in 1926, 
But in 1922, an earlier vote to remove this failed. Oregon has had a very sad reputation when it comes to uh, dealing with the race issues in, in the state. And as a kid growing up in what was liberal Oregon, I thought that was a, quite a surprise to me to discover this part of the uh, aspect of Oregon's history. Slide, please. I should say that Oregon, that uh, Jesse Applegate walked out of the convention. He was so disgusted by uh, by what they, the uh, exclusion law and some of the other anti, some of the anti-racial aspects of the Constitution, that he didn't sign the Constitution ever, walked out and said he would have no part of it. Uh, hang on just a minute, I've got a phone ringing, sorry. should stop in a minute. I'm embarrassed by this. <laughs> so anyway, I'm almost finished here. But this is from the San Francisco newspaper. And this deals on the third and a mysterious aspect of Josie's of Jesse's life, his involvement in the Modoc War of 1883, that was fought just south of the Oregon border in California. And you can see by this time, 1883, Jesse's wealth had disappeared. He had a lot of hard times. And so he'd moved into this area and this was Applegate's house as it's described here. He became very involved in an effort to remove the Modocs from this area around California and send them up to the Klamath Reservation up in here, Fort Klamath. Um, the resistance of the Modocs to, re, to, do, to removing themselves, to being removed, resulted in what became as a Modoc war, one of the bloodiest wars in, uh, in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, uh, General Canby. Canby, Oregon is named for him, and he was the only American general ever killed in the Indian War. He was killed in the Modoc War. Slide, please. And I will end with this slide. On the left is Captain Jack, and on the right is uh, Sean Jinjo. Captain Jack was a leader of the Modocs. The war lasted about eight months. Uh, a lot of American soldiers were killed, not many Modocs. Um, they knew how to fight in the, in the lava beds there in Northern California. But they eventually had to give up. They were starved out, they were captured. And there was a trial at Fort Klamath. And uh, so I tell that story and, um, Several of the Modocs were hung as a result, and one of them was uh, Captain Jack. And so that also is part of the story of Jesse Applegate. And with that, I will just uh, stop and move, let, uh, let Steve take this over again. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. As you may detect, race is a theme that runs through all three chapters. Um, Abigail Scott Dunaway ran ran into uh, Confederate sympathizers in her neighborhoods uh, who treated her not well for her union beliefs. Uh, and uh, as you can tell from what Greg has said, it's very much at the core of his chapter on Jesse Applegate. Dick Neuberger's, uh, 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 the racial element of his story will, will come as I tell you about. Uh, my father and Dick Neuberger met in the 1930s. They were uh, sports editors of their respective college newspapers, Dick at the University of Oregon and my father at Oregon State College. They also shared the same mentor at the Oregonian, <clears throat> the sports editor named L.H. Gregory. So later in their lives, the Newburgers would come to Pendleton, where we lived, and um, I suppose the first time I met him was about eight years old, something like that. The last time I met him, I was 13 and, and uh, old enough to grasp what I was looking at uh, across the dining room table from me. And uh, the Nibbers, the day prior, had been at Multnomah, Multnomah Stadium watching the US Air Force Academy play one of the Oregon schools. And the entertainment at half halftime was a, a Falcon brought there by the Air Force. And Dick was so fascinated with his Falcon that he went home and read everything he could find on Falcons, on falconry. And listening to him talk, he was sort of the ultimate classroom teacher, ultimate 
uh, professor, I'd never encountered a, uh, an intellect that voracious. Well, it took me until about 1978 to decide to write his biography. I went to his widow, Maureen, and uh, talked to her about doing that. She shared with me, she gave me a uh, invaluable piece of research, uh, a graduate thesis from the University of Oregon by Celia Ann Doris, uh, which was a thesis uh, for a speech degree. And it was on the rhetorical uh, style of Richard Neuberger in the 1954 Senate campaign. Dick Neuberger's life was uh, not quite the stuff of fiction, but it, it's, I think we could say it's highly unlikely. By the time he died in 1960 at the age of 47, he had written at least 750 magazine articles, national magazine articles. He had either authored or co-authored seven books. He was the first Democrat Oregon sent to the US Senate in 40 years. He was the second Jew elected to the US Senate following the 17th Amendment, which required direct election of US senators. He was the original co-sponsor of what became the National Wilderness Act of 1964, and he was author of the Highway Beautification Act. By giving Oregon Democrats a liberal voice and breaking the Republican hold on Oregon, he created what we might call the modern uh, Oregon Democratic Party. Prior to then, the Republicans, it was the, re it was the reverse of today, shall we say, the Republican Party was the, pro the uh, party of progressivism. And the Democrats, in the words of, I believe, uh, Hans Lindy told me this, the late Hans Lindy, uh, were very inarticulate. Well, Dick was quite, quite articulate. And through his magazine articles in the Oregon press and nationally, and on the floor of the uh, state house and then the state senate, he articulated a far-reaching uh, set, of, set of values. One of his biggest, Dick's biggest adventures, and this is one of the more, um, oh, unlikely stories, shall we say, not unlikely, but hard to imagine. At the age of 21, two years out of, uh, two or three years out of Lincoln High School, Dick decided that he would go to, to Germany. Uh, this is 1933, Hitler had just taken power. He went with his uncle Julius who could speak German and was sort of his guy. They went to the, where the family had come from, the Neuberger family, New, Lewis and Neuberger family, Heinstadt, Germany. And with, with Julius's help and just by uh, uh, his own uh, repertorial instincts, he found his way into homes and businesses, and he learned the full horror of what the brown shirts were already doing. He came back to New York City uh, wanting to tell this story. He took to the New York Times. They would not publish it. Uh, Dick's mother told me that they, he, she felt they, their reason was that they could not substantiate what he said. So he went down the street to the Nation magazine, uh, then uh, about, uh, it was founded in 1867, so whatever that age would be, this was 1933. And Ernest Greening was uh, an editor who was assigned to him and Gre Greening bought the article for $38 in 1933. And as Greening said, it was an epic make making article. It was the first uh, article in the American press about what really was going on in Germany. And it caused quite a stir. Uh, it's, uh, you can find it online. Um, and uh, even today, it's, uh, it's an alarming piece of journalism. At the same time, he, he wrote uh, another piece for the Journal Opinion. It was a journal of Jewish life and, and letters. I would not have known about this except for one piece of paper in Dick Neuberger's papers at the University of Oregon. I didn't, I'd never heard of opinion and you would not find it in the reader's guide to periodical literature. So I finally uh, located uh, the full collection, which is at the New York City, New York Public Library. My wife and I went there and we just started with 1933 when it came into existence or 1930, I guess, because all he says in this interview I found was that he wrote on Jewish topics for opinion. And Dick never, that I could had found before had written about Jewish, um, topics. 
Well, well, this article and the CIS subsequent appearances uh, at the National Jewish Congress that year uh, and in uh, various Jewish newspapers uh, in the big cities of the country uh, put him on the national stage. And he met an assortment of uh, very prominent, prominent people. Dick's uh, public life is uh, fascinating, of course, but as with so many public people like actors and certainly politicians, he had an inner life that was unseen. And uh, the uh, biggest uh, glimpse I got of this was in um, a letter that Maureen Neuberger, Dick's widow, wrote to him uh, during the war. Uh, two of my invaluable sources have been Anne Goodsell and Kate Goodsell Marquez, who lives in Clabeth Falls. Um, Anne lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They've been very generous in sharing uh, details of the family, the family, the family life. And uh, in this case, the wartime correspondence of Dick and Maureen. As I told Anne at some point as we talked about this, she said, I said, you know, I know where, where Maureen fit politically in his life, but I have nothing saying, you know, I love you. So uh, this is a letter uh, in the correspondence. This is from Maureen Brown to Richard Newberger. They are not yet married. On the surface, you present a jovial attitude and have such a good sense of humor that I know most people would be surprised to know that you were often tense and deeply concerned over many matters. At times you have seemed to me like a little boy who needed a lot of loving and someone to look after him. I wonder if you will ever allow yourself to be completely happy because you have several viewpoints and they sometimes conflict until they become complexes. I see this especially in your attitude toward me. I know you love me and deeply, but I don't epitomize all the qualities you seek in a woman. What you need is three wives, one who will be a perfect cook and household manager, another with good business sense and secretarial qualities, and the third to be always impeccably dressed and a paragon of social attainments. Dick responds to this uh, very interestingly. Um, he says, uh, I am complex to you because I think a lot and worry a lot about the world, about my stomach, about politics, about everything. But that is my nature, I'm afraid. Yet so far as you were concerned, I am not complex. I love you completely, intimately and devotedly. I think you must sense that. I hope you love me too. Dick was, uh, a world-class warrior and uh, according to his uh, late sister, Jane, uh, Jane Newberger Goodsell, uh, an extreme hypochondriac. Uh, the family uh, had a complicated element uh, in uh, Dick's father, Isaac, or better known as Ike. Ike had a, a compulsive gambling problem and uh, he darn near took the family business into uh, insolvency. Uh, the family had to uh, take the business away from him and install Dick's mother, Ruth, to run the business. Um, Dick was estranged from his father. And throughout his life, even in the US Senate, he would get a phone call from a Portland man saying, your father has told me that you're good for these, his gambling debts to me. It was terribly embarrassing to Dick. Uh, first slide, please. So Dick and Maureen uh, marry shortly after the war. This is, this is Dick at his typewriter in uh, either the, I don't know which home it's in. Uh, he, uh, Time Magazine referred to him as a Niagara of nonfiction. His productivity was enormous. I have uh, listened to people who watched him write. Unlike most of us who write a paragraph at a time, Dick would write the entire article in one sitting. And this capacity of his to grasp something totally uh, intellectually also comes through in what you can hear of when he was on radio, in radio broadcasts and speeches that he made. Uh, next slide, please. This is the Dick and Maureen legislative 
franchise. They won in 1950, they, Dick was in the Senate and Maureen was elected in the House. And the way I have put this is that Dick was really the writer and director of this, um, this drama, this political drama, and Maureen was the supporting actor. And um, she, uh, at the same time, she really made his career possible in many ways. She, she softened his appeal. Dick was an urban kid, she was a farm girl. And uh, in 1950s Oregon, the farm vote mattered in a way that we have no idea these days. And so Dick worked that issue uh, hard in that, in that election. Next slide, please. This is the Newburgers voting on election day at Ainsworth School at Portland Heights. On their left is little Ann Goodsell, 12 years old, uh, obviously distressed. The Newburgers lived nearby. They lived in Portland Heights. They lived on Clifton Street walked over through the playground. And this is a measure of how heated that election was. Uh, Anne's classmates booed Dick. And you can pick that up on his face there. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little worked up over this. And uh, when Anne tells the story, she, uh, she sheds tears. Um, next slide, please. This is uh, two days later, they won. And the good soul, daughters are, are right in front of them. Dick won by 2,462 votes across Oregon. That's less than one vote per precinct across the state. Took, I believe, two days to count the votes. Uh, and interestingly enough, it ended up in Hermiston, Oregon, uh, around the Hinkle Rail Yards, uh, which in those days was a democratic territory. Uh, not these days. Um, Dick's uh, legacy was, has been celebrated in many ways. The Oregon Environmental Council has had a, an award um, named for him and um, a mountain in Alaska was named for him. The magazine writers of North America uh, established an award in his name as well. And I will stop with that and uh, we will be happy to take your questions. which Kerry will feed to us. Yes, uh, th through the chat uh, section down there, you can submit questions uh, to ask about these, uh, that's these three eminent Oregonians, about the three eminent Oregonians they profiled. And uh, Greg, I'll throw out one for you. Was and I, There's been some mention of that on, on the chat that Applegate was certainly a man of uh, contradictions, uh, opposed to slavery, but yet was supported strong slavery candidates uh, like Joseph Lane and others, uh, and then uh, wound up fighting the, the Modoc tribe. Uh, and just comments about, about how Applegate, uh, you know, dealt with all these contradictions. Well, he was a man of contradictions and he never really tried to explain them. But it, as far as his dealings with the tribes, and I'll talk about the Modoc war for a minute, he sided with settlers in their conflicts with the Native Americans. He had a number of friends among the Native American tribes in Oregon. But in the disputes, when the, uh, there was conflict with the Native Americans, he almost always sided with the settlers because he had his, he had his life here and was protecting his life. And so if he had to take sides, he took the sides mm -hmm. of the settlers. And that's what happened with the Modocs. There's kind of a mystery. It really isn't known much about the Modocs. He wrote extensively about his time at the Constitutional Convention, what happened in Missouri with his farm there. But by the time he got down to Northern California and he'd had to give up his farm in Yoncala because he fell, fell on economic hard times, he was pretty mysterious about his life. So not a whole lot is known about, uh, about his attitude toward the Modocs, oh, other than he did, did write in a number of instances that he tried to keep peace between the Modocs and the settlers. And it was a, a failing that, uh, of his that he wasn't able to achieve that. But there seemed little doubt he took the side of the settlers during the war. But I don't think he ever actually raised, handled a weapon himself. Jane, a question for you, uh, and we touch upon this in the exhibit, Abigail fought for so hard and so long, so many decades for women's rights and the right to vote. Was there a time where she actually 
she actually became the issue and may have impeded uh, the vote at time because of her strong uh, personality. Yes, I actually think she did impede to some extent. She was, uh, she wanted to do what she called the still hunt. And it was more of a one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, legislators, meeting with men um, whose wives were supportive of suffrage and so on. Whereas um, as the campaigns went on in other parts of the country, there were more activists, uh, people who wanted to do demonstrations and go into bars and, you know, break up, um, break up a few of the bar moments. And uh, and there was, she was very concerned that she didn't want suffrage to be in the same league as prohibition, and she was fearful that if there were these campaigns to um, that were more rabble rousing as opposed to what she called the still hunt, that people, men would vote against giving women the vote because of the, um, because of the uh, prohibition and um, alcohol related issue. Uh, but the other thing was that she, she would get into arguments. Um, she would write sort of caustic letters. And at one point in one of the campaigns, uh, the nationalists basically said, uh, the best we can do is to leave, uh, to leave Oregon severely alone, which is one of those great quotes that I love. And so Abigail wanted some of the nationals money and resources, but she did not want them to come in. Um, in the 1905 campaign, which was not the last one, um, she was quite ill and uh, it was during the exposition, the Lewis and Clark exposition, exposition, and her brother Harvey was the chairman of that event, and he scheduled an Abigail Scott Dunaway day, which was sort of surprising since he was totally, uh, you know, unsupportive of suffrage. Um, but the, and Abigail, um, several of the national people came, including Susan B. Anthony and others came to that event. And then they stayed on for the campaign and did ask her if she would just step aside and to see if that would make it possible for them, for Oregon to, you know, to make the passage of um, suffrage. Dick, one of the most, probably the most famous feud in Oregon political history, of course, was, was the feud between fellow progressive liberal Democrat senators serving together, Dick Newberger, and of course the irascible Wayne Morris. Uh, a question from a, from a listener, uh, was either of them more the instigator in the riff or was it mutual? It's an interesting puzzle. Um, it's not really so much a puzzle because it's all out in the open in the papers that I've been able to read and some more I will read. Uh, Wayne Morris uh, had a, a, a um, to say his relationship with Dick was complex is stating it mildly. He was Dick's law professor at the University of Oregon. Uh, he flunked Dick uh, in criminal law at, at Oregon, leading Dick to leave the university. Dick has no university degree, had no, no university degree. And um, Morris uh, became uh, Dick's uh, advisor, political advisor, a mentor, uh, helped him win election. Uh, and uh, then they get to the Senate together and uh, I, I would submit that Oregon, uh, Oregon was unique among states. I don't think any, any other state has had two such blinding intellects in the Senate at the same time as Dick Neuberger and Wayne Morris. Well, you can take your pick for what started the feud. Uh, it's all small stuff. I'll just leave it at that. It's in the book. Mm -hmm. So you can read, it's all small stuff which is what they always are. Uh, it's terribly, it, it's, it's seldom about any major uh, principle. Um, but um, the, uh, the uh, correspondence between the two became uh, venomous. A. Robert Smith, who preceded me uh, as a Washington correspondent in Washington, DC, wrote the book, Tiger in the Senate, uh, the first biography of Dick Neuberger followed by Mason Druckmann's biography of Dick Newberger. I'm sorry, Wayne Morris, Wayne Morris. Wayne Morris and Wayne Morris, yes, what am I saying? And um, Bob was there when the feud happened and he saw the correspondence at the time. And he said, uh, I have the feeling that Dick was writing his letters for history, whereas Wayne Morris was simply being uh, Wayne Morris and being uh, venomous. Uh, 
as I spent one day at the University of Oregon Special Collections reading room, pawing through the correspondence between them, especially Morris's, I was just exhausted and I went back to the Campbell house where I stayed and I called my wife and I said, I'm worn out <laughs> reading about, reading this venomous uh, diatribe between the, the two of them. It was, it was uh, the bottom of the, uh, of uh, Morris's attacks was he vowed that he would, he would run against, uh, or he would, he would work against Morris uh, Newberger's reelection in 1960. Uh, another element that's not in the book uh, that's out, but will be in the full biography that I'm going to write in a couple of years, uh, is that national figures such as Arthur, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. and other such large national liberal voices wrote Morris, especially asking him to quit it, that it was doing the Democratic Party no good. Mm -hmm. Newberger died so tragically young at age 46 of uh, testicular 40, cancer. 47. 47. Would, in today's medicine society, would they, medical, would they have found it earlier? Could he have been well, saved? Well, I, I think, I think uh, what I've been told by medical people is that the treatments that he was given at the time were by today's standards crude. Um, and uh, no doubt, no doubt it may have been caught earlier or dealt with in a, a better way. That, that could well be. A question for all of you. What was the most surprising thing you learned about your subject in doing the, your research? Jane, we'll start with you. Oh, you gotta, you're on mute. I just said, of course you'd start with me. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. I, I would have to say that um, I was surprised at how depth she was as a speaker. There's a professor at um, USC, Randall Lake, who maintains a website of her speeches. He's become enamored with Abigail Scott Dunaway through the years. And, and so you can go online and read them. And I read them all. And one of the things that struck me uh, was that she was she was so articulate and so gifted in her speeches that which would have been very unusual for the time women weren't even you know they were they just weren't supposed to be you know speaking um, in public at all and I think the variety of subjects that she spoke on and, and one of the ones that I was so struck with is that she gave a presentation for I might have been for Columbia Day or something but her premise was what the United States might have looked like if settlement had begun on the West Coast instead of the East Coast. And I just thought that was such an innovative thought. Um, and, and I just, I, I was struck with the depths of that kind of creativity and her ability to speak, which is very different than being able to write, but that she could do both um, was really remarkable. Greg? I was fascinated by the contradictions in Jesse Applegate's life, and I'm going to address one of the very good questions that's, that's, that's on the page here. His best friend in Oregon was Matthew Deedy, who was president of the Constitutional Convention, who was very pro-slavery, never apologized for being pro-slavery. He was a U.S. district judge for many, many years. Uh, Applegate helped him to survive the aftermath of the Civil War. But uh, they argued and argued about slavery, but Didi always, but Applegate always considered him a very close friend, and um, probably more than Didi considered Applegate a close friend. And they finally had a falling out late in life. But um, Applegate should just one. I mean, this will answer another question here that that's on the page about slavery. Jesse rented slaves in Missouri, and probably not very many, and this. And this he didn't own slaves with one exception, and I'll go to that in just a second. But he had to rent slaves because there wasn't white labor available, as I understand it. And this is one of the reasons he wanted to get the heck out of Missouri and come to Oregon, where he, he fought against slavery. But according to the history, he did have one slave, a slave girl who helped out his wife in Missouri. Again, it's a contradiction in his life. 
is explained by some relatives of being that this was a sickly girl and he thought he could help her by uh, bringing, bringing her into the home. And whether that's true or not, he did have one slave while he was in Missouri, whatever the, the circumstances, circumstances of that were. But just another example of, his, uh, of the contradictions in his life. And Steve, most surprising thing you learned about Neuberger? Well, I think it, it was the, um, the changing, ever-changing relationship between him and Morris. Uh, I've seen the correspondence of him um, telling Dean Morris at the law school that he would, he would leave. Uh, I've seen the voluminous correspondence between the two of them as Dick entered the state legislature Morris, remember, was a Republican at this time. Dick was a budding Democrat, giving new life to the Oregon Democratic Party. You see Morris encouraging him in that way. And you see Morris um, um, then um, congratulating him on uh, breaking the back of the uh, Republican Party, of which <laughs> Morris was then a member. Um, and then uh, what I observed in the correspondence was that uh, Dick did his best to ingratiate himself to Morris. Uh, he would bring him little gifts. Uh, Morris would speak uh, in letters to Dick in a way that I'm not aware that Morris spoke to people. Uh, he would say, um, uh, you came and went out of Washington and you didn't come by to see me. I'm going to get very angry about that. Uh, I've just told Mrs. Morris that you're getting married. She, she's uh, very uh, excited to hear that. Uh, and thank you for the cufflinks you sent me. Um, and even, um, and this gets to the feud and the viciousness of that feud, even uh, months prior to when the feud broke out in public, I, uh, I found a, a postcard that uh, was lodged for why I don't know in Charles Porter's uh, papers at the University of Oregon. Charlie Former Porter congressman from Eugene. Was a congressman from Eugene, a contemporary of Dick and Morris. And uh, the postcard was from Wayne Morris to Dick and Maureen. Postcard was from Germany. Dick and Morris was there on a Senate Foreign Relations Committee meeting and he was telling Dick and Maureen how valuable this trip was. And at the very bottom of the postcard, handwritten of course, it says, it looks to me like it says, love, to you both, Wayne. Well, Wayne Morris didn't send love to anybody, I think, but his daughters. So I took a photo of it and enlarged it and it says love. <laughs> and so I think one of the reasons Morris was so um, vicious in his uh, response to their disagreement was that he had allowed Dick to touch him emotionally. Uh, Morris was not renowned for, for doing that. Uh, the late Senator Albert Gore Sr., I asked him during my interview with him about Wayne Morris. I said, how would you describe him? <clears throat> and I'm going to paraphrase this because they're in front of me. <clears throat> uh, it's in the book. He said, uh, Wayne Morris was uh, enormously uh, intelligent, enormously articulate, enormously vain. And he loved to be by himself. In other words, he was not fond of collaborating with other senators. Dick was the opposite. He sought collaboration. So there's an element of that. But the uh, trying to, you know, trying to sort out any breakup in a relationship uh, is difficult. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, in political with political rep relationships, they're often about small things. If you watch the senators who avoided this, Hatfield Packwood, for instance, Magnus and Jackson, both of the same party from the same state, which is rife, you know, with, with uh, problems because they, there's only so much limelight to go around. And especially if you're in the same party. And uh, I know how Magnus and Jackson worked it out. I covered both of them in DC. Um, and I'm pretty well aware of how Packwood and Hatfield handled each other. Whatever feelings they may have had for each other never broke out into public. So it's, it's a fascinating uh, sort of a side element. And it, it poisoned the Oregon Democratic Party for quite a while in the sense that in the, oh, I would say 10 years following Dick's death, 
there were Morris Democrats and there were Newberger Democrats. Um, so there you go. Senator Hatfield told me one time that Morris didn't suffer fool, fools gladly and he thought everybody was a fool, <laughs> was, how, was how he, he put it. Uh, a question from newspaper man, Mark Garber. Uh, Steve, kind of, kind of you and all of you, how would you choose the three and would there, is there a fourth or fifth or is there a sequel coming up? Three more eminent Oregonians, so. Well, as I mentioned, I wanted Abigail. She's an icon, but I wanted the life. And uh, I wanna add parenthetically, as a member of a newspaper owning family, I'm fascinated with Abigail because she's one of a handful of women worldwide who started a newspaper in the 19th century with the meager education she had. It's phenomenal. Uh, we reproduce in the book, the circular promoting the new Northwest, her paper and the front page of the first edition. So that's Abigail. I, I did not pick uh, Jesse Applegate. That was Greg's choice. I wanted Greg. I knew Greg from his prior books. And uh, so that was his choice. I've wanted to do Newberger for 40 years. And so here, here he is. Um, as I say in the preface to the book, uh, this is not our, this is not a hall of fame. This is not a, our choice for, you know, most prominent Oregonians or anything like that. There are a number, any number of people who deserve this kind of treatment, but in putting it together, uh, you have to find a writer who is enthusiastic about that person and is capable of delivering the chapter. Neither of those, the second part is no small matter, as you know very well, Carrie Timchuk, uh, <laughs> because you've written a few books. Um, so uh, that's where it came from. But uh, certainly there could be others. Um, a is there a sequel in the works? <laughs> well, my editor, our editor, Marianne Kennington Lang made that suggestion once. And it's a matter of uh, if other writers have a passion that they want to uh, share, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk to them. I'll leave it at that. Well, we've reached the end of an hour. It's eight o'clock and we thought we'd keep the program to an hour and we've been delighted to be joined. We've got at least 75 people joining us this evening, which has been great. Uh, and so thank you all for joining and uh, any last words from, uh, not, of course, not your total last words, but last words for tonight uh, from each of you. So, Jane? Well, I just, um, I hope people will come and visit the exhibit um, at um, the Oregon Historical Society and, uh, and that you'll maybe pay attention to the other five women who are listed and inscribed in the Oregon Capitol. Since there are so many men, you know, I would I would encourage Greg, maybe you could, um, or encourage Steve to maybe do a book of eminent Oregonians that's just women, <laughs> just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's more than a little something to that, Jane. <laughs> when I was a correspondent in Washington, Washington State installed its second statue in Statuary Hall and it's Mother Joseph. I've spoken to you about her. Exactly. I think she might be very interesting to you. <laughs> in fact, but my wife pointed out at the time there were only seven women in Statuary Hall. What a wonderful book, especially for young girls. Yeah. And the women are all the archetypes. Yeah. Uh, you know, teacher, physician, lawyer. There you go. Yeah. But Mother Joseph, uh, whose real name, uh, her, her given name was... Uh, Para, Parizeau was her last name. She's French Canadian. Uh, is a fascinating. She founded this the Providence system of hospitals, orphanages, schools, and so forth. But I figure that all of the papers are in French. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be my luck. Yes, we'll, do, we'll deal with that, Jane. Yeah. <laughs> Greg, anything else? Oh, let's see. I, I just. That fascinating part of this was when you write about somebody like Jesse Applegate or some of the other people we're talking about here, you learn so much and it becomes an exploration and a you know, self-education and, uh, and a real re it's real rewarding. And I just want to thank Steve for, uh, for bringing this subject to us and encouraging us to write our, our chapters. And it's been, uh, been a great uh, collaboration. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Working with you too, Jane.
as always. Likewise. We have worked together in a number of other projects. It's been a very, very great adventure. Well, thanks to all the three of you. And for, uh, again, the book is available at the OHS uh, gift shop. And I would remind the listeners tonight that uh, you, OHS just announced our kickoff speaker for the 2021-2022 20, uh, Hatfield series is Yamiche Alcindor, the host of Washington Week on PBS. And she'll be uh, delivering a Zoom presentation uh, later this month. More information on our website, www.ohs.org. And we have an outstanding group of Hatfield speakers uh, coming in the spring of 2022. So be on the lookout for that. Good work, Carrie. And let me just Thank say, you. so much of my research is done at the Historical Society. It's just a treasure load of, uh, of history and great information and original letters and documents. I couldn't do any, any of this work without it. And even better news, our newly refurbished library is just about ready to reopen. To, to scholars and uh, after getting its first facelift in half a century, it's uh, very excited about it. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.